In October of 1977, Vermont was the center of the ancient world. As professor, anthropologist, and historian, Warren L. Cook convened the Ancient Vermont Conference at then Castleton State College to ask if stonework found in the forests of the Northeast could be the work of pre-Columbian European explorers. I'm Mike Luoma. As a Vermont-based author and researcher looking into possibly ancient stonework in our woods of the Northeast, I have some things in common with, and a lot I owe to those folks who gathered in Castleton in the late 1970s. As the 45th anniversary of the Ancient Vermont Conference approached, I headed to the Calvin Coolidge Library on the campus of what's now Castleton University to check out their Ancient Vermont exhibit, still on display, and their Warren L. Cook collection. I'd also get an unexpected look at some work from one of the conferences more noteworthy or notorious participants. The exhibit of photographs and stones is on a back wall on the library's second floor. Heading upstairs, we first encounter a display case and a possible torso labeled the Venus of Calendar 2. In the case are several plaster casts, impressions of markings on stone, which their creator, Barry Fell, author of America BC, interpreted to be the ancient Celtic language Ogham. There are two odd stones, a picture of and medal presented to Warren Cook, and a book co-authored by Warren Dexter, whose photographs make up most of the ancient Vermont exhibit and who discovered the possible torso here, the Venus of Calendar 2. Each plaster cast is labeled. In creating the casts and painting them, Fell made these marks seem perhaps more idealized than they appeared on the actual stones. Back past the stacks, we find the ancient Vermont exhibit itself. A few select stones on the floor, and a bunch of photos, most by Warren Dexter. A 
Aside from the Yargalon stone, all of the stones displayed here are said to symbolize phalluses. Some were said to be found alongside stones or bedrock resembling vaginas, or yoni, or like the Venus of Calendar 2 up front. I'm not sure I'd agree with all the phallic interpretations. This exhibit is a composite of artifacts and photographs that researchers believe offer answers to the questions addressed at the Ancient Vermont Conference, it says. The exhibit, originally created by Dexter and Cook, is in its third reconstruction. It also says members of the Vermont chapter of NERA, the New England Antiquities Research Association, maintain and update the exhibit periodically. I noticed, however, that this looks like it was printed on a tractor feed dock matrix printer. As those went out in the 90s and Dexter passed away in 2007 at age 96, this may not have been updated in quite some time. Which is fine by me. It stands as a time capsule of Vermont stone site investigations. We see author Barry Fell with a standing stone, which I think may be one of the ones on the floor. Author Byron Dix, who'd go on to co-write Manitou, can be seen in a couple of photos. Dix and co-author James Maver came to see the stonework as more likely the creation of ancient indigenous peoples, as they detail in Manitou.
After looking at the exhibit and display upstairs, I headed down to the Vermont room. Librarian Michelle Perry, technical services cataloger, archives, made Warren Cook's collection available to me. Thank you again, Michelle Perry. She also pointed me towards a set of wooden shelves, discovered tucked away somewhere, their Barry Fell collection, on indefinite loan to Castleton. Bonus. I'd go through the Barry Fell stuff for sure. But first, I wanted to get to know Warren Cook a little better and see what more I could learn about the ancient Vermont conference. The program from the ancient Vermont conference lays out their goals. A symposium to examine the evidence related to Vermont's numerous semi-subterranean root cellars roofed with massive stone slabs and sometimes associated with inscriptions, standing stones, great lithic phalluses, and other elaborately carved rocks. The controversy is heated as to whether they are colonial, represent a heretofore unappreciated dimension of Native American accomplishment, or are indeed ancient intrusive and relics of an as yet little assessed transatlantic impact upon America. Such questions can be best clarified by enabling scholars of many disciplines to examine the abundant artifacts recently come to light, and by stimulating learned debate as to their significance. We see the presenters. Vermont State Archaeologist Giovanna Neudorfer, Byron Dix, James Whittall II, Salvatore Michael Trento, Gloria Farley, and Barry Fell, among others. This may have been when the lines were drawn between the Academy and what they declared was too fringe. Neudorfer rebuked many for pseudoscience and Cook for enabling and giving them an academic platform. But Cook had an open mind. He'd look into Bigfoot with some thoroughness, too. In his recollections on the conference, Cook lamented the fact the logistics of hosting prevented him from spending more time with its participants. Cook taught at Castleton beginning in 1960. He was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for his 1974 book, Flood Tide of Empire, Spain and the Pacific Northwest, 1543 to 1819. He officially retired in 1987, but still taught courses for the next year or so. He died of a heart attack in December of 1989 at age 64. The collection was obviously put together posthumously, as it included memorial notices and obituaries, even a 2003 Barry Fell Award from the Midwestern Epigraphic Society. Fell, best known for America B.C., put out two sequels, Saga America in 1980 and Bronze Age America in 1982. He died in 1994, but he seems to have left many plaster casts on permanent loan here to Castleton. Besides those on public display upstairs, this wooden shelved file seems to contain examples of possible Ogham inscriptions found in Vermont and New Hampshire rendered as plaster casts. Some have, unfortunately, been nearly destroyed, almost completely shattered. Others could be swapped into the display case without a problem. I tried to match up labels which were loose as best I could as we look at this collection.
As with the pieces in the display case, the impressions and the plaster casts and the way many are painted seem to render these casts a bit more idealized than the stones themselves. These, to me, look more like Ogham than the actual markings do on the stone. There are certainly some interesting pieces here. Judging by page numbers written on the shelves, some may have been used in his books. I didn't expect to see a collection of Barry Fell's plaster casts here in Castleton, but it did give me more to show you from the Vermont room than just me going through papers. Some research just doesn't look good on camera. Rather boring and not at all photogenic.
Contrary to what some might expect among academics and antiquarians, it's the antiquarians who have advanced and continue to evolve their ideas about the stonework by continuing to research the origin of these features. Following the lead of Byron Dix and James Maver in Manitou and others, many antiquarians now see the stonework as more likely indigenous than Phoenician. While the Academy, for the most part, refuses to even consider any pre-colonial origin for the stone features, as if it's settled science, it's not. Forty-five years later, the repercussions of this conference are still being felt. The entrenched rejection of anything but post-contact, colonial, or later explanations for the stonework in the New England forests by academic archaeologists and anthropologists became dogmatic and continues to impede progress in these areas. To label ideas deemed on the fringe to be pseudoscience can have the unintended consequence of shutting down advancement and new ideas within the science, resulting in scientism, as anthropologist Curtis Hoffman called it in his 2018 book, Stone Prayers. In labeling everything other than post-contact stone construction pseudoscience, the field shut itself off to new discoveries, and that's too bad. Ultimately, the biases of folks like Barry Fell and even Warren Cook limited their appreciation for what they were finding, leading them to see likely indigenous creations as the work of ancient Europeans. Looking back at the ancient Vermont conference, there's some irony at the self-congratulations for their open-mindedness, while they're still blinded and closed-minded in some serious ways. Even though the program claims they'll address whether the features, quote, represent a heretofore unappreciated dimension of Native American accomplishment, end quote, there's little evidence they actually did this. Yet now... That appears to be what some of the stone rows, chambers, and stone assemblages do represent. An unappreciated dimension of indigenous accomplishment. My thanks again to Michelle Perry of the Calvin Coolidge Library at Castleton University for her help in seeing the exhibit, the fell materials, and the Warren Cook collection. Once again, most photographs in the exhibit were by Warren Dexter and are shown here for reference purposes, without claim of rights or ownership, courtesy of the Calvin Coolidge Library at Castleton University in Vermont. All items and photographs shown are in the custody of, or are the property of, the Calvin Coolidge Library at Castleton University and are shown thanks to their cooperation. I'm Mike Luoma. Thank you for coming along on this visit to ancient Vermont.